Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I manage the Open Nottingham program at the University of Nottingham, which is a program of work designed to increase the use, reuse, and publication of open educational resources, uh, but really with a teaching and learning slant. So, we're talking about releasing teaching and learning resources under Creative Commons license. Uh, the program has been running for a number of years now. So, um, I was asked to come and talk about open educational resources as um, a slightly kind of on a different angle to what you're talking about from open access, but trying to draw some parallels and see where things chime, both with open access and also um, open publication of teaching resources. So that's what I plan to do. Um, and really, we've been making open educational resources available through our traditional model of, of releasing teaching resources for a number of years through our YouNow website. So we, we self-publish onto that YouNow website. Um, and really, there's also a case study in this talk talking about how we, we started to look at um, moving that model just from and publishing traditional teaching and learning resources into um, moving some, excuse me, um, publishing resources as iBooks and eBooks. So it's a really self-publication case study looking at both our traditional model but also looking at how we might um, publish into new formats. And really underpinning that it is the question for us around um, where open resources are born digital, um, are eBooks seen as a tractive alternative? So are users likely to want to um, download, view eBooks and broaden the access to our own open educational resources. So that kind of underpins um, the case study level kind of self-publish model that I'll talk about. Okay, so it's probably helpful before I start to look at that, that self-published DIY approach to um, publishing some, some e-books to talk about the background of open educational resources at Nottingham. Um, so our YouNow website was launched back in 2007. Uh, we became a member of the Open Courseware Consortium, MIT's initiative, back in 2008. We received some JISC funding uh, along with a number of other institutions as part of the UK OER programme. So it was a three year programme funded by JISC. Uh, we had a project to release um, 360 credits worth of teaching learning resources uh, as OER uh, along with a whole, whole bunch of other institutions uh, and that was a funded model for that year. Um, at the end of that, that funding period um, we returned to a self model of, of funding open education resources at Nottingham um, and, and really that was when Open Nottingham was born. Um, and, and really we're about publishing, but also building tools and services that help easy discovery of open resources, as well as easier reuse of open resources, um, including tools, and then latterly started to look at how we might expand that model into um, open iBooks and eBooks. Um, so just to expand a little bit about, about some of the tools and services that we've, we've put together or offer at the university, YouNow is, is our website where we release our open educational resources under Creative Commons license. Um, we also release as an open source piece of software um, the, the, the Xerti tool which allows non-technical developers to produce e-learning content um, seamlessly, quickly and easily. You don't have to be a developer. But most importantly, um, it, it then publishes that resource to the web and allows you to add a Creative Commons license to it immediately. So again, following that self-published model of pushing things out to the web with an open license. Um, we also built the expert search engine, which we think now uh, may be, apart from iTunes U, the largest collection of open educational resources in the world. So uh, last count it had um, 326,000 resources in there. Now that's not a repository, but what it is is by using RSS feed, we're um, aggregating content that exists all over the web. So we pull in MIT's um, open courseware feed, the open university feed, all open feeds, and then we offer that content in, in one search engine. Um, so it'll hold titles, um, metadata, and things that are openly licensed in, in that search engine. Not all of it is Creative Commons open resources, um, although a, a big bunch of it is, but it, it's a resource that, that continues to grow about um, a number of resources going into that each week. Uh, we also, like many institutions now, have a YouTube um, education channel and an iTunes U account, so we, we push content out in that fashion. Um, one of our more recent um, initiatives that we've been working on as well is releasing a, a search engine that searches just for images uh, within the Flickr database that are licensed under Creative Commons. Um, I'm sure you experience the same trouble whether it's an open access publishing or open educational resources that copyright clearance for images, diagrams are a really kind of key issue. So what this, this service does, it allows you to search for just openly licensed images in Flickr, it will find that image and then the kind of the value add bit is that it will also append the Creative Commons license to the bottom of the image. So instead of having to do that manually, it will, it will do that automated for you. And we also built an extension to that that will allow you to upload your own images. So whether you're a publisher, self-publisher, um, anybody with an interesting kind of um, 
putting licensing onto images, that service will allow you to upload your own images and, and append the license information onto the uh, in line with Creative Commons best practice. Uh, we're also building an extension Moodle plugin which will do the same thing, again allowing people within our institution to upload their images, put licensing on them, making that next step of going fully open with, with broader teaching resources much easier because it really is, we, we find, images that cause the major problem in terms of releasing teaching and teaching and learning resources. Uh, we'll open up all of that, um, that Moodle plugin openly so anyone with a Moodle installation will be able to make use of it. We're also talking about maybe releasing some code if we have time to, to finish that off that allow other, other um, VLEs to pick up that same functionality. Um, I should also say that while we work on the teaching and learning side, the university also has an engaged centre for um, communications which really looks after the research side of things. So some of you may know Bill Hubbard that runs that unit in Nottingham. Um, so we just want to kind of um, flag up here that Bill looks after the research side when we work on the teaching and learning. We do talk and there is crossover, um, but sitting in the audience today of a, an open access audience, I'm really starting to think we need to do more maybe to talk to, to, to each other and that includes myself thinking more about how research might influence what we're doing with OER, but maybe how OER can also influence um, open access. There are many crossovers. Um, I've been to many OER conferences, don't necessarily see um, open access people at those conferences, and I'd level that, that same in me about open access conferences. I should maybe be going to more of those as well, so maybe there's kind of a, a story for us all there to think about how we might think of, of these two things as supporting each other going forward. Okay, so where does this um, Open Educational Resources Initiative sit at the university? It's within our strategic objective, so it's a stated objective to increase the amount of open educational resources we, we release to the world. Um, and the university cites a number of reasons why we engage with this. The, the social responsibility agenda, which is where it sits in the strategy, but also um, excellence in education, which is our student um, experience objective, seeing how we might be able to point students directly at open resources, um, but also thinking about how we might, might work with lecturers and academic staff to use other people's open educational resources to broaden the experience or to um, feed into what they're, they're already thinking of doing it. Um, overt promotional opportunities, both for the university and also for the staff members, the schools that are releasing content. Uh, we're quite open about that. We release or make our open educational resources available for some schools directly from our online prospectuses. So we're starting to gather data on whether that has an impact into people at least moving to our prospective site from our, from our open resources. Uh, we're quite overt about that. Uh, we're all in it first and foremost because we think it's the right thing to do, but um, as an institutional driver, it's also important that, that we um, find um, models that might sustain. Um, the university has campuses both in China and Malaysia as well as Nottingham. So the sharing of content across the, those campuses is a really important thing. Um, so internationalization is a big part of the agenda that we're, why we're engaging with, with, with OER. Uh, and cost efficiencies as well, if we can maybe reuse content, um, I guess there's no such thing as starting with a, a blank piece of paper, but if we can get people to think about reusing content where it's out there, saving time, um, enhancing, is there some cost efficiencies that can be gained? And we've seen case study evidence that that can be the case. I'm not saying that that's the case all of the time, and there's often barriers to people using OER. Um, so it's all those things that need to be considered, but we've seen where, where it, it can work that there are some time savings that you can make. Okay, so uh, what support does it have at the university? It has senior support, and this is interesting as well in that um, open access at Nottingham um, is, is mandated. So as, as you'd expect, um, open access for research journals where appropriate is mandated at the university level. The teaching resources, it isn't. It's an opt-in process. So we've had to spend a lot of time going out to talk to people, um, line things up. It has full senior support and senior backing. Um, all academic boards have signed off. Um, the vice-chancellor is engaged, pro-vice-chancellors, um, various senior managers, <laughs> various teaching and learning committees are fully signed off as well. Um, but at grassroots level, at the people who are producing the content, it's an opt-in um, program. So we spend a lot of time talking to people and actually we find that that's really engaging because when, when people do engage with this and want to get involved it's something that they're keen, keen to do. So we found that's been quite a, a positive model, uh, the opt-in model. Okay, so in terms of kind of impact to, uh, of this, um, a growing number of schools are publishing open content. I think at last, last count we had around 70% of schools and departments across the university um, with an open educational resource presence. Now, hands up, some of that is just one or two people testing the water with one or, one or two bits 
Um, but for some other schools, such as the, um, the School of Politics and International Relations, they make all of their module um, handbooks and outlines available as open educational resources. So stuff that's only really available previously to registered students for the whole school is now made available uh, as open educational resources, which is a, a big step. And we feel we have quite a mature publication model in terms of the way we approach this. Um, but really, for, for the most part, the last few years, it's been, I guess, what we would say is our, our traditional model which is really uploading and storing resources in the Aquila Digital Repository and then using web services to deliver those through, through, through our website. Um, we have a metadata and cataloging team at the university who help us with making sure the resources are, are, are findable. Um, but then through RSS technology, this is where like, the self-published part comes in, in that once those resources are in there, we then push those out to a variety of sources on the web. So we push them out to the MIT initiative, also to a site called OER Commons, they go into Expert, we manually make them available in, in Durham, the UK repository for teaching resources, another site called Merlot. Um, so we, we really, once we've got those resources from the, the academic staff member, it then becomes a self-published model to the web, different in many respects to uh, the open access movement. Um, also something that's, that's quite interesting in, in, in the OAR model is that it's really built around the institution retaining the copyright of the materials. Um, so when we release materials under Creative Commons, we retain the copyright. Uh, we're clarifying the permissions in terms of what we're happy for people to do with the resources, but that copyright sits with us. We don't sign that copyright over to, to a third party or a publisher. Um, there's no embargoes on any of that material, and we found that's quite important in terms of OER, that people want current content that's being taught in the curriculum at the moment. So we try to push things out in, in a timely fashion, and that there's no APCs. now. I'm not making any kind of value um, judgments or statements here about those, those things. Um, I know those uh, discussions are, are nuanced, but for OER, it seems it's kind of on a different track in terms of publication. Um, but I suppose then the responsibility to publish is very squarely within the universities. And so there's a few kind of pros and cons in terms of pushing content out that it's teams like the one I work in that would have the responsibility to make, make content available. Okay, so that's kind of the, the general what we're up to in Open Nottingham. Maybe some of that chimed with you in terms of the things you're working on. Maybe, maybe it didn't, but um, I was also asked to talk a little bit about what we did in terms of self-publishing um, iBooks and eBooks under Creative Commons license. Um, so that's the next little bit. This started really with some JISC funding to um, create a number of modules in the area of sustainability. Um, so we created 10 10 credit modules in the area of sustainability from different subject perspectives. Um, that content was, uh, I've got some timings in here that I wasn't aware of, so that's brilliant. I'll just keep those in there just to make sure you're watching and then uh, when nobody shouts out, so. That joke as well was a lot funnier in my head, so I'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and just crack on, crack on with this. Um, so we produced a whole uh, bunch of content um, and that content was also, as well as being written by university staff members, we also reused a whole bunch of OER. So there was about um, 400 pieces of OER that we incorporated into that, reused, um, and that meant we were trying to prove the same, same model as we try and talk to academic staff members about, that you can reuse stuff on the web and try and learn from that, that experience as well. So um, here's an example of what the, um, the web version looks like, quite traditional, menu-driven, um, th these things were 10 chapters, so they were quite me meaty resources. Um, and it, we, we spent uh, a while publishing them as so we are through our normal channel. But then we also um, published four iBooks through the iBook store. So we used the iBook author software to, to have a look at this, which we found really relatively simple to use. Um, there's a few desktop publishing skills, but we felt that people, if you did want to self-publish, it was very much within the grasp of non-technical developers to be able to do that. Um, we published them as the University of Nottingham and we allocated ISBNs to them, which is something we'd never done before with our teaching resources, which was seen as a real positive step by the academic authors because it was a feel that there was some official publication happening and not just providing teaching resources. Uh, and we also used a bunch of um, openly licensed images within the books to try and give them a real rich feel. And we felt that was really helped to show how OER might be able to drive up quality in terms of publication. Okay, so we uh, released those titles in, in two parts. Um, and interestingly, I checked last night that if you run a sustainability search on your, your iPad for um, 
in the iBook store, then our engineering title actually appears as the most downloaded, which was great to see. And a number of them also appear um, in, in the top 10. These are just some examples of the, um, the iBook pages. So we went down quite a design route. When I checked the timings down there, they didn't do anything at all. So um, I don't know if my arch enemy has been playing with the timings on the, on the laptop or not. Again, I shouldn't really do jokes, should I? I didn't really get any better than, <laughs> than the previous last attempt. OK. So uh, we didn't want to just lock things into, a, um, into the Apple system. We think that's great. We've got no problem with Apple publishing at all. But um, it's not really fully open if, it's, if you have to buy an iPad to access it. So we all want, also wanted to release these things in ebook format onto multiple platforms. This is an example um, of the ebook um, format, so put, pushed into Kindles and things like that. There was a number of pieces of work we had to do in order to make that happen. It wasn't seamless at all. I don't know if anyone's had a go at kind of self-publishing in ebooks. I'm sure some people have, but we found it, it wasn't straightforward. If you want to push things out onto different platforms, you had to fiddle about with it a little bit. I had to strip out a lot of the images from the iBook versions because they didn't quite work in the Kindle, especially the black and white or older versions. So while there was a lot of benefits to pushing stuff out, we didn't feel there was kind of a, a push button option which would make this such a, a simple thing that we, we could roll it out and, and try and get other people to do it without some additional support. So we pushed things out to a whole bunch of different places. Um, some people might work at some of these places in here, maybe not. So it's on the Apple iBook store. Um, we tried to push it out onto the, the um, Amazon store, but not able to publish for free on there. Um, it's in, we're looking to push it into Google Books. We use Smashwords, which is a site which allows a number of different functionalities. Um, and, and that's really where we went down. We're in Bar on Barnes & Noble as well, um, a few other places. We, were, we did try to put things into Project Gutenberg as well, if that's something you've heard of. Um, but this is one of the issues we found with this, that although that's our URL for sustainability, the business perspective, when you go to it, um, it finds the Mayan calendar saga, get you crazy on, whatever that might be. Um, <laughs> So there's a few people not laughing there, so I'll assume that you're the ones that have read the Mayan calendar, get you crazy on. Um, so you might want to check that out rather than one of our books. But um, So this was some of the things, I guess, when you, that you think about self-publication, that these are issues that you have to work through. If you go through a publisher, maybe those subscription fees and all of those things that sometimes get shouted down a little bit are buying you um, the ability to kind of not think about those things. So... I always feel that in the OER world, sometimes publishers do get um, hit quite a lot about fees and things like that, but always try and, and think about the fact that it's a, a balanced argument, really, and the only way we're going to move forward with this is to move forward as kind of colleagues together. So I was trying to think about that myself. So impact on this, we had a look at some stats here. Um, the iBooks by far and away outstripped the popularity of, of the um, other downloads. So 70% um, of the downloads for the resources where there were comparable resources across the different platforms. Um, the iBook system really um, won hands down. Um, they, they are really nice books as well, not just, I mean, in terms of content, but what the iBook author software allows you to do. So maybe that's influenced it. We haven't really dug too much deeper into the meaning of some of these statistics. But um, interestingly, the ebook and the iBook versions really did take the, the lion's share, and people didn't seem to want to be downloading our traditional open educational resources as much as they were interested in downloading the, the, the book versions. Again, we need to spend more time kind of working that through, but headline stats just seem to be quite a big difference there. Um, in terms of complete accesses, though, um, this, the, the highest stat here is people still seem to want to consume that content directly on the web, our reusable style content on the web through the UNOW site. That still outstripped the um, downloads that we were getting through, through the store. So, it, um, again, there's a lot of things we could think about that are influenced in those statistics, but headline stats seem to suggest that people were still interested in consuming that content online, maybe because it offered easier reuse. Um, people could take that content away much easier from the website than they could the books or from the, from the iPad versions, but um, nevertheless, kind of the, 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 the statistics. Uh, now, the university has also um, just, well, not just, a number of months ago signed up to the FutureLearn initiative. So um, I'm sure you've all heard of um, MOOCs and um, FutureLearn, edX, Coursera, those types of things. And the university is now also um, looking to run a course. We're running our first in January. 
And I just really want to put this out there that maybe this is an opportunity for um, open access, open educational resources to think about kind of the, the end user in all, all of this and how open content in a timely fashion, available free, um, admittedly there'll be some charges in terms of kind of um, a certification and accreditation around MOOCs, but in terms of free access to content, potentially MOOCs offer some opportunities um, for, for all parties to think about freeing up, freeing up content in a, timely, in a timely fashion. Okay, so I think that's kind of what I wanted to cover, so I don't know if anyone's got any questions, but I'd be more than happy to try to answer them. <laughs>